But let's go ahead and get started. So just in terms of a quick outline, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about uh, GraphQL uh, as a technology. We're going to talk uh, about the endpoints and the queries that you can run. We're going to provide some sample Python and R scripts that you can use, and also then talk uh, about the data access and provide some links um, and technical support information as well. Now, for those of you um, that might not be familiar with Open Targets, uh, we do have a number of refresher courses uh, that are available. There's a fantastic quick tour uh, of the Open Targets Informatics tool that Helena actually recently created uh, that you can go and see, and it's up to date uh, as of June of, of this year. So please do go and check that out. We also have a, a webinar that we recorded earlier this year. So if you're looking to become familiar with Open Targets and really dive in, those are two great resources uh, to consult with. But for those of you uh, maybe who are joining for the first time today who thought, oh, Open Targets, maybe I'm interested in drug discovery. In a nutshell, uh, Open Targets and the platform is a comprehensive uh, data integration tool that really uh, focuses on helping users uh, identify and prioritize therapeutic drug targets. Uh, as I mentioned, we integrate data from a number of public data sources. We have an association scoring algorithm and we also provide uh, information on annotation for targets, diseases and phenotypes, as well as drugs. Um, so if there's anything just to take away from that, it's that the platform is all about target identification and prioritization. So essentially, can I come up with a list of targets for a given disease or can I come up with a list of diseases for a given target. So when I talk today about the different endpoints, that's really what I'm going to be using um, as the basis of how we can uh, use the API to sort of answer those two research questions. Okay, so now just in terms of a very quick introduction to GraphQL, I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with it. Uh, pr prior to April of this year, the platform actually ran on a REST API, and then we decided to change to GraphQL because it offered a number of key benefits. One is that the queries are graphical in nature, so it allows you to traverse a data graph using resolvable entities. This reduces the need to make multiple queries, and we're going to we're going to show a couple of examples about that uh, later on. This query syntax is actually quite easy. They're all post requests uh, and it involves a query string and variables. Uh, whereas in our previous REST API, we had both GET and POST requests. Uh, in our GraphQL API, they are all POST requests uh, and they're based on uh, this idea of what we call a query string. Another benefit that we have is that there is an interactive browser and documentation that's available. So we have something called the Playground, which I'm going to show you uh, throughout the webinar today. Um, and that has built in documentation as well as a schema so that you can find out what fields are available uh, and the descriptions of those fields. And you can use that to create uh, and construct your query. And lastly, um, we provide language agnostic access. And so, as I mentioned, that um, all of the queries that are run in GraphQL are uh, based on a query string and the post request. So you can use your favorite programming language to construct uh, your query string and access all the different endpoints. And later on, I will show you uh, examples using R and Python. And as I mentioned uh, momentarily ago, um, uh, the basis of GraphQL is that everything is a post request and is based on a query string. And so the format, uh, as you can see here, um, looks like this, and it's actually very easy, uh, and we're going to break it down. So you begin with a root operation, which is mandatory. So in this case, we're running a query. And that's what it's mostly going to be for all of the queries that we're going to run today. It will always just be query. This is just saying I'd like to run a query against uh, the API. Then we can name the query if we want. So for example, um, you know, targets uh, associated with psoriasis, for example, or diseases associated with BRAF. And this is an optional field. Then you have the endpoint field, which is mandatory. And so we're going to go through some of the endpoints uh, today. Uh, but this, for example, would be I want to find information about a given target or a given disease or a drug. We also have arguments, and these are mandatory as well. The arguments, for example, could be the ensemble gene ID or the EFO ID of a given disease or the Kemble ID for a given drug. And again, these arguments are mandatory uh, so that our API knows exactly what data you are looking to access. 
And then you have to specify the fields that you want. Um, and so this could be either a simple field that just returns a string, it might return a Boolean, it might return an object, an array of objects. It really depends on the field um, that you are looking to query uh, and the data that you're looking to access. And lastly, there are also field arguments. Uh, and some of these can be mandatory, some of them can be optional. So we might have fields where you are allowed to pass an additional argument, maybe to filter the data or to access a specific subset of the data. And so these could be mandatory or they could be optional. But as I say, the great thing about our GraphQL API is that if you use the playground and the schema to construct your query, you will actually see the error messages if, for example, you haven't declared a mandatory field. For example, uh, if you haven't declared the endpoint uh, or you haven't specified any arguments that are required. So, one of the other benefits, as I said, is uh, that there's the, this interactive playground and the schema, and this really does help you generate a, a query stream that you can use to access our data. Okay, so that was sort of GraphQL in a nutshell and the query stream, but rather than spend a lot of time going over GraphQL as a technology and whether or not it's better than REST, I figured let's just dive right in and look at some of the different endpoints and the queries that you can run. So to begin, we have, oh, my apologies, we have the target endpoint. So we are open targets. We are all about target identification and prioritization. So our target endpoint here provides annotation information that would be available on a target profile page. And the argument that is mandatory uh, to use this particular endpoint is the ensemble uh, ID. And so to the right of your screen here, you can see a sample query a string that I have pulled uh, that from our playground. But I thought uh, what would be even better to do is actually show you the API in real time. So if we go back to looking at the query string here, we have query. And in this case, I'm asking it, I'd like to query our, our API. I do have a name here, it's called search, but instead I'm going to change this. As I say, it's an optional field and it can be whatever you'd like. I'm just going to say, um, find target information. I'm using the target endpoint here. I'm passing the mandatory um, argument here, which is the ensemble ID. And then these are the fields that I'm looking to access. I want the approved symbol, the ID, and then I'm looking for some of the expression data. And I can use either the documentation to the side here, or I can use the schema here to help me construct um, my query. And once I think I might have the query that I'm looking at and I've got the data and I think I'm, I'm okay and I wanna run it, I just press the play button here and kind of like magic, uh, on the right-hand side, you will see the results that are returned um, from the API. And as we mentioned, um, the target in endpoint provides all the information that you would find on the target profile page. So if we open up, for example, the target profile page for rows one, I have specifically asked for the baseline expression information. So in this case, all of the data that is contained within this baseline expression section is what I have asked for uh, in this particular uh, API query. So the target endpoint provides um, a number of fields that you can access in order to get all of the information that is on the target profile page. You can get known drug information, the safety information, tractability, cancer hallmarks, anything that you see here uh, would be available from the target endpoint. Now, as I said, we have targets, but we also have diseases because we are all about helping you identify and prioritize drug targets. And sometimes you want disease annotation information to know if there's maybe known drugs, if there's any clinical signs and symptoms, um, or even if there are um, the ontology, excuse me, uh, and the child terms and the parent terms uh, of your specific disease. So as I say, the disease endpoint, like the target endpoint provides the annotation information for diseases. And if we look, for example, at the chronic kidney disease uh, profile page here, we have all this information that we display and in using the API to construct a query, uh, again, I'm using the query, uh, the query um, operator 
I have search here as my query, but I'm going to change this to um, find uh, drug information for a disease. I'm using the disease endpoint here uh, and I'm passing through the mandatory um, argument, which is the EFO ID, and then the fields that I, I'm asking for here to, for example, generate the known drugs. And then I press the play button and I see all of the information on the right-hand side of the page. And lastly, the, three, the third entity that we have in the platform and the third endpoint is the drug endpoint. And so this endpoint, like the target endpoint, like the disease endpoint, it provides annotation information about a drug. So for example, we might look at the rofococcib uh, profile page here. We can see a lot of information about this particular drug, the mechanism of action, the indication that there are some drug warnings, and also the pharmacovigilance data. If I wanted to uh, query the API and get this information, again, I'll just open up uh, the API here and I've constructed my query string, again, starting with query because that's what we're going to be doing all the time is querying our database. I have the name of my query, but again, I'm going to change this to say, find information about rofecoxib. I'm using the drug endpoint. I'm passing the mandatory argument, which is in this case, the Kemble ID. And then below, I'm listing all of the fields that I am interested in. And again, I used both the schema and the documentation that is available here. So for example, I'm in the drug endpoint here. I can see all of the information that I can request. For example, ID here matches there. I'm also asking for name, matches there, year first approval, matches there, et cetera, et cetera. And then by pressing the play button in the center, again, I now have all of the data uh, that I've requested from the API that will be returned uh, on the right-hand side. So those are kind of the three main endpoints, the sort of the beginner endpoints that I thought I would start with just to show that it's about constructing a query string that starts with the word query, then you might have a specific name for it if you'd like, or you don't have to. Uh, I specify the endpoint, and in this case, we've reviewed the target, the disease, and the drug endpoint. They all have a mandatory argument. In this case, it's the um, drug uh, ID here, it might be the target uh, ID or the disease ID, and then I'm also requesting the various subfields uh, at the bottom. So as I mentioned, these are sort of the three um, sort of introductory uh, endpoints. And before we go on, I thought maybe I would just stop here and maybe ask my colleague Helena if there are any questions or if we should move on to discuss some other endpoints that you can use. Yes, so there is a question in the chat, which is, can you search for multiple terms in a single call? So for example, multiple Uniport IDs? No. The GraphQL API, and it's something that we're going to uh, discuss um, uh, a little bit later, our API is really optimized to work for one single entity, um, whether it's a specific target disease or drug or target disease association. If you wanted to search for multiple entities, you would have to run a for loop uh, or you know, iterate through a, a list. This is not the most ideal way to access our data. And we will uh, talk about some different ways that you can access it that are actually much easier uh, and will provide data immediately for you in various different formats. So be on the lookout for that. That'll come in probably about 20 minutes or so. Perfect. Um, that's all for questions for now. Okay, perfect. So let's go on then and let's talk about some of the other data that you can get from the API. So as I mentioned, the Open Targets platform really at its core is all about helping researchers and scientists identify and prioritize drug targets. And often we have our users that come to us with one of two sort of main questions. The first question might be, I'd like to find diseases that are associated with a target. Maybe they were at a conference. Someone was talking about uh, a drug target, uh, you know, a protein that uh, might be new and revolutionary. And they'd like to know if we have any information about diseases that might be associated with that specific target. 
So if you wanted to query for diseases that were associated with a target, um, you can start by using the target endpoint. And the reason why you do this is because we have a field called associated diseases, and that is where we return to you the list of diseases that are associated with a given target. So if we go back to my example um, of rows one, you can see here on the right hand side that we have the query string here where I'm asking for the target endpoint and passing through uh, the uh, mandatory argument here, the ensemble gene ID, and then you see the field here associated diseases and I'm asking for this information back. So let's see this in practice. So again, this is the same query string here. So we're starting with query. And instead of calling the search, I'm just going to say call this uh, diseases associated with rows one. And I start with the target endpoint. And that's because within the target endpoint, we have the field called associated diseases. And if you ever weren't sure about where that field would be, again, we can go back to the documentation or the schema. So if we look at target here, and if we begin to scroll down here, as I say, we'll see all the fields that I might ask for that are the annotation. But right at the bottom here, we can see associated diseases. And if I click through, I can see all of the different arguments that I could potentially pass um, to this specific field, because remember, some fields may have optional or mandatory arguments. And I can also see here underneath all the different kinds of information that I might actually get back if I were to query this particular field. So let's go back to the query string here. And you can see that, as I say, I've got the associated diseases field here. I'd like to find the count uh, and the rows and within each row, I'd like to ask for the disease, the score, and the data source score. So if we go ahead here, and we're just going to uh, press the play button, and you can see on the right-hand side, we have all of the results that are available. And if you wanted to match them um, and make sure that you're getting all of the information back, you could look at um, the actual platform uh, UI. Uh, because it will be uh, the same information. If we go to associated diseases here, we can see 386 uh, diseases uh, that are associated with rows one. And if we go back to the query that I've run here, we can see the count is 386. And the first disease is non-small cell lung carcinoma, which matches what we see right here within the platform. And so, all the information that I wanted here about I want the associated diseases for my given target, rows one, uh, is available um, from this particular query. Now, I just before we go on, I just wanted to deviate very slightly and make and ask my uh, colleague Helena to make sure that I don't go too far. But remember, at the beginning of the uh, webinar, I mentioned that one of the benefits of GraphQL is that we have these resolvable entities. So sometimes you can negotiate or traverse um, the knowledge graph that we have, our data graph in our, in our database uh, by using resolvable entities. So in this case here, if you look at line eight, within each row that is returned for an associated disease, I have access to the actual disease itself. And what's really great about this is I could ask for other information about a disease based on the information that's available on the disease profile page. In this case, I'm just asking for the ID and name, but I could ask for the description, or I could ask for the ontology or the clinical signs and symptoms or the known drug information. In the past, if you were using our REST API, you would have had to run two queries here because you would have had to query our REST API and say, I'd like you to give me all of the disease, diseases, excuse me, associated with rows one. Then you'd have to turn on, run another query and say, okay, now for each disease, I want you to give me the ID, the name, the known drug information. Whereas with GraphQL, because we have access to the resolvable entity here, I can get all that information in one query. So this is making it much more performant, much more powerful to see the true uh, breadth of all the data that we have uh, within the platform. So this is something that uh, I think is a real, real benefit 
Um, and so if anyone's thinking, oh, I'm, I, you know, Andrew, I was used to your old REST API. Why did you have to take that away? It's because I, I truly believe that our GraphQL API really does offer um, some fantastic benefits. One of them being the fact that you can access some of the information about one of our entities when it's a resolvable uh, entity in, in the result uh, and, and in your query string, and that reduces the amount of queries that you actually have to run. So it, I think it actually makes it much more powerful and performant and gives you the data that you're looking for much quicker. Okay. So that is one use case, which is I'd like to find diseases that are associated with a target. Now, if we, there we go. Oh, perfect. Now, if we flip it and say, I'd like to get targets that are associated with a disease, again, we do the same thing. We're going to construct a query string. The only difference here is that because we're asking for associated targets, we're going to be starting with the disease endpoint, because in this case, I have the EFO ID for psoriasis, and I would like to know all of the associated targets that are available. So again, uh, we've got this sample query here, and I'm going to change this, uh, our query string um, uh, name to uh, targets associated with a disease. And again, we're starting with the disease endpoint. I'm passing in the EFO ID. I'm asking for a few uh, little bits of information about the, the disease, just to make sure that I'm accessing the right disease. And then I'd like to find the information about the associated targets. Uh, in this case, I'm looking for the count, the rows. And again, like the previous example where I had access uh, to the disease object itself, I now have access to the target object itself. So all of the information that's available from the target endpoint, I can access here. So for example, I might ask for tractability information to determine whether or not the list of targets that I've actually retrieved back, are they even suitable, for example, for a small molecule or an antibody um, uh, drug therapy? So there's a lot of very interesting uh, data that you can get from the resolvable entity, particularly the target, because we have so much rich target uh, annotation information. And again, by accessing it within your first query, you reduce the need to run subsequent queries and you'll get all the information back that you want um, in the one query. So if we go ahead here, we're going to press the play button. Now, this one is going to take a little bit longer uh, simply because I'm asking for 6,196 search results. Um, so not to worry, the little um, sort of uh, indicator, it's sort of like our API is thinking, it's just trying to figure out, let me get you all the information that you need. Um, and of course, if you make a much more complex query, it might take a little bit longer, um, but this is a very performant API because it's going to return all the information for you in this one query rather than needing to break it up into multiple ones. Okay, so before we go on, because I now have talked a little bit about how you can find the associations for a given target or a given disease, I would like to ask Helena if we've had any additional questions come up in the chat that we can answer now. Andrew, so there's just a quick question about how do you get the therapeutic areas, for example, if associated with a disease when you query for the disease in the target endpoint? Yes, so um, the therapeutic area for the results um, itself, yeah. So yes, if, uh, if you wanted to um, do that, when you go to, uh, let me open up this query here. So just to make sure that I understand correctly, you're looking for the therapeutic area for the disease that's returned here. In this case, I would go into the disease object um, and I'll go through the documentation just to show you the, the um, uh, all the different information is available. So as I say, I'm starting with the target and I was looking at the associated diseases and I'm getting back um, all of the rows uh, and each row has a disease. So this is now all the information that I have access to. And so if I, for example, were to ask for therapeutic areas here, I would be able to get back some information. So let's go ahead and add in therapeutic area. And what we can see here 
is an error message. Now I've done this deliberately. I know that I would usually have to add uh, a, a subfield here, but again, as I mentioned that one of the benefits uh, of the API is that you're getting the um, error messages right in the uh, playground so you can see what might be wrong uh, with your query. In this case, it's telling me that the field therapeutic areas of type disease must have a subselection. And so when you get that in, what it's telling you is, is that there's a field underneath that you need to add, ask for specific information because it doesn't know what you want back for the therapeutic area. So let's ask for the ID and the name. And let's run that. Now, what we can see here, and I hope that this is very clear, and if not, please reach out to us and, and we can uh, absolutely walk you through this because it might be a little bit confusing. So we've started here with each row. So we've got the 386 um, diseases that are associated with rows one. So if you're looking at the UI, this is what you'll see. And in the first result that we have here, we have the disease, which is the non-small cell lung carcinoma. So if we go back here, we've got non-small cell lung carcinoma, but you wanted the therapeutic area. So in going into the disease, I've asked for the therapeutic areas field, and I've asked for the ID and the name uh, subfield for therapeutic areas. So I would like the ID and the name of the therapeutic areas. And in this case, I'm getting back OTAR, 0010, uh, which is our ID for respiratory or thoracic disease. I'm not sure if I said that print right, but I'm just going to leave it there um, because I don't sometimes always say the science words correctly. Um, but we've, we've got the name there of one of the uh, therapeutic areas. We also have another therapeutic area, cell proliferation disorder as well. And if we were to continue to go down in all of the results, we'll get the same information back about the therapeutic area, and that will match the information that's available. So if we were to open up the non-small cell lung carcinoma profile page, and just give me one moment here to do that, you can see the two therapeutic areas are cell proliferation disorder and respiratory or thoracic disease therapeutic areas. And in asking for therapeutic areas and ID name, I'm getting that information back in one query, as opposed to having to run multiple queries um, in other kinds of API endpoints. Okay, Perfect. and then there's just another question, which is in this run, I, so I'm, I, the way I interpret this is when you're looking for diseases associated with the target, can you also then get the drugs that are associated with those diseases? Yes, you can. So again, because I have access to the disease uh, information, because I've got access to the whole object. So anything that you see on this page right now, I have access to in the one query. So if we go back here, and I'm going to, again, open the documentation. So I started with the, um, if we go back here, I started with the target, and I would asked for the associated diseases endpoint. And for each row, I get back the disease object. And these are all the different fields that I can get back for the disease object. So we started with the therapeutic area. That was the previous example. Now let's look at known drugs. Well, known drugs is the information that we display here. For example, about known drugs that have been indicated uh, either an investigational or an approved indication for non-small cell lung carcinoma. So I can access this information because I have access to the drug, uh, sorry, to the disease object. So we'll use the known drugs field here. So again, let's go back and instead of asking for therapeutic areas, let's ask for known drugs. Now we're going to run this. And again, we get the same error message. Known drugs must have a subselection because there's a lot of information that we have about known drugs. So let's use our curly brackets and open up the known drugs and look at the kinds of fields that we can get. Now, a pro tip, uh, if you want to see the fields that are available when you've opened up um, a specific, uh, or excuse me, the subfields that are available uh, when you've opened up either an endpoint or a field, press shift and spacebar, and that will bring up the little pop-up that you have, that you can see here, where it showed me all of the different fields that I can now access within the known drugs field. So let's ask for unique drugs and let's also ask for count. And then we'll also in each row, just 
for example, going to ask for the drug. And within there, I'd like to ask for the ID, the name, and is approved. So you can see here, I'm getting quite nested because I've started with target. I'm asking for the associated diseases. From the associated diseases, I'm actually getting the known drug information and then even getting some of the drug information to see if it's maybe something that's relevant to my research. So let's go ahead and press the play button here. Again, we're going to see that it's going to take a little bit of time because we're traversing a really complex graph, but just give it a moment, let our API do its thing, and you're gonna be very happy with the results because you'll get back the data that you're looking for. So let's go back to uh, the right side here, and we can see we've got the 386 uh, results. The first result, of course, is our non-small cell lung carcinoma. Now, there are 344 unique drugs, and 5,319 uh, rows of information that we have. Now let's just quickly go to the non-small cell lung carcinoma profile page just to verify that we've got the correct information. And it looks like we do. We have 5,319 rows here. And if we scroll right up here, we have 344 drugs, which if we go back to our uh, API response, is what we have right here in the unique drugs. And then for each drug, for example, I've asked for the Kimball ID, the name, and whether or not it's approved. So we have here a number of different drugs. Um, most of them, they look like they've been uh, approved. Um, and that would correspond with all of the information here that you can see. And I'm pulling in the drug information that I would usually have to click through and, for example, get on this profile page, but I'm getting in the one single query. So this query is really showing, in, in many respects, a very powerful query because you're traversing our three main entities, the target, the disease, and the drug. Okay, That's shall we go on? Now. Okay, yeah. perfect. So let's, let's move on then. Okay, so, We've shown you the list of associations uh, for uh, a given target or a given disease, but now you might say to me, well, Andrew, it's great that you've shown me the score, but I'd actually like to get some of the underlying information because maybe there's a publication ID that I would like to read, or I'd like to know a little bit more about maybe the clinical trial that was used as evidence or uh, some of the curated uh, evidence that might have come from other sources. So. If you wanted to get the evidence that supports an association, you can start from either the disease or the target endpoint, and you can begin to explore the evidence and filter by a data source. So we're going to walk through this. Um, so just bear with me for one moment. Oops. Sorry, there we go. Perfect, okay. So here I've got uh, an example of IL-22 and atopic eczema. And I'm looking to get the information and the evidence that's available um, for this. So I've started with atopic eczema. That's my EFO ID here. I'm starting with the disease um, endpoint and passing through the mandatory field of the EFO ID. Um, but I'm asking for, in the field itself, I'm asking for the evidences field, which is available uh, when I go through and provide, in this case, an ensemble ID. So I'm asking for what's the evidence that you have for uh, atopic eczema and IL-22, which is this uh, gene ID here. And in this case, I'm just uh, segmenting or I'm asking for just the open targets genetics portal. Uh, information back. And if I click through here, I can see that we're getting three, excuse me, three rows back with all of the information here uh, that has been returned by the API. And again, if I go through the documentation and I start with the disease and I say, okay, I'm looking at all the information here, but I'm looking specifically for evidences. I passed in the ensemble ID and for each row, these are all of the different fields that I might be able to access uh, from the evidence. And in this case, I've just asked for these specific fields here. Uh, and some of them have a, a subfield as well. 
So that's how you would get the evidence that supports an association. As I say, you can start from either the disease or the target um, endpoint, uh, depending on you know what your I, I would almost say your sort of primary entity is if you're looking for um, diseases that are associated with a target or targets that are associated with the disease. And then you can look through the evidences field, pass through the corresponding either disease, EFOID or target ensemble gene ID, and then find the evidence that if we have any that does support uh, that particular association. And then you can add that evidence for example, to your own downstream uh, pipelines as well. Okay, so I'll just pause here momentarily before moving on and showing some sample scripts. Helen, do we have any questions? Yes, so there's been one additional question, which is, can you get information about just one of the results that the API returns? So could you search for a specific entry and then look at the subfields for say that one drug or that one molecule? No, you would have to run it as a separate query um, because it will, um, when you specify, when you write your query string, it's going to run that query string against all of the different results. It's going to return for you all of the fields. Uh, I think you would be, you might be better off to either ask, ask for, excuse me, all of the information and then filter it in your own pipelines um, or run a second query uh, if you're looking, you know, maybe for specific fields and only for maybe one of the returned uh, results. Perfect. Okay, perfect. Well, thank you. Okay, so let's move on. And I'm going to just show you very quickly um, some sample R and Python scripts. These are available for download. So please be uh, looking out for the email that will come from Anna as well as um, the uh, YouTube recording. Uh, they will be included uh, for download. So you don't have to worry about copying and pasting or trying to take a screenshot because uh, they are available. But I just wanted to show um, that I'm using R. Uh, and as I mentioned, it's all about having a query string where I pass through uh, the different um, variables. Uh, in this case, I'm looking for the ensemble gene ID, and I'm simply just making a post request. So in this case, you can see down here, the post request that I'm making to our API endpoint. And for Python, it's the exact same thing. I'm building a query string, I'm setting my variables, and I'm running the post request. Uh, and then you know, doing what I would like with the request. So regardless of the language you use, whether it's JavaScript, Perl, um, Python, R, you name it, uh, Ruby, it's uh, at its core, what you need is the query string and you build the query string here. And that entire string is what gets posted back uh, to our API and will return the data for you. And as I say, those, uh, scripts will be available uh, that you can use freely um, and uh, adapt and adjust uh, if you would like for your own purposes. Now, I just wanted to talk very quickly um, about the different ways that you can access our data. So if you are previously familiar with the uh, Open Targets platform, you know that we've got our um, web interface where you can search for, you can browse for one target, a disease or a drug and find some of the association information as well as the underlying evidence. Then we've got the API. And this um, requires a little bit more programmatic skill and it deals with more comp slightly more complex um, data queries because you can access various endpoints to retrieve the association evidence uh, and annotation data for a single uh, query and a single entity. Um, but where it becomes a little bit more complex is that you can use the um, resolvable entities to negotiate and navigate our data graph. Now you might be thinking, okay, well, that's great. I love an API. I'll learn how to use GraphQL. And then I'm going to hit your API with a lot of queries because I want all of your data. Well, here's the problem we kind of have a bit of a limit on our API because as I mentioned at the beginning, our API is really optimized for a single entity or target disease association queries. If you're looking to do something more systematic or comprehensive, for example, for hundreds of entities, we strongly recommend that you use either our BigQuery instance or our data set downloads because those really support the very systematic and comprehensive queries. And I'm going to provide you with a quick example to show you why this is important. 
So let's say you want to retrieve all diseases that are associated with the target. Now using our API, our API uh, provides 50 results um, for each query. So you'd only get the first 50 back, and then you'd have to run another query for the next 50. Whereas if you used our BigQuery instance, for example, you could run the query once and get all the information back. So I wanted to just very quickly show you uh, where this comes from. So we had um, a user that posted in the community, which is a, a forum that we have where we provide a lot of sample scripts and information about how to access and use our data. And so they wanted to essentially get all the associations back for a given target. Well, of course, the problem is, as I say, that our API only returns 50 results for each page, and then you have to ask for the next page. So the first query that you actually run is something like this, where I'm asking for associated diseases, and I get 50 back. And you know, I'm asking for all the row information, for example, the score and the disease. And then the next query that I have to run, I am actually incrementing the index from zero to one because now I want the next 50 results. As you can imagine, this can become really tedious and time consuming because you have to know the total number of results that are available, divide by 50 and then run your script that many times in order to get all of the data back. Instead, if you were to use BigQuery, you would be able to get all the data back in one query using SQL, uh, and you can use uh, you can use BigQuery and export the data into CSV format, into JSON format, Google Sheets, or even into your own BigQuery instance. So, if we look, for example, here at the query that we might run, we can see that we've got just the standard sort of SQL. We're going to select a few different uh, columns from the associations by overall direct data set. Uh, we want to join on diseases so that we can access some of the disease information. We also want to join on targets so we can access some of the target information. And I am using the example here of, I believe it's CAV1. Um, and then I'm asking for it to be um, ordered by the association score. So if we look at the API, just to show you the difference, as I say here, I'm only getting 50 back and I would then have to go and say, okay, now give me the next one. And then I get another 50 results. Okay, and then give me another 50. So now I'm getting the next page results. Whereas if I use BigQuery, I could do one query here. As I say, I will just uh, zoom in here where I'm asking and selecting a number of different fields. And then I'm asking for it to be ordered by the association. And if I run it here, just give it a moment to think. Google's doing its thing. It's returning all 947 results for me, which is what matches on the page here. It's for CAV1, as I say. And in this uh, particular example, I can save the results in different formats, CSV, JSON, BigQuery table, Google Sheets, et cetera. So while the API is very powerful because it allows for the one sort of single entity single association query, there is a limit when you're looking to do something much more systematic and comprehensive, you want to get a lot of data, we really would strongly recommend uh, that you look at uh, BigQuery or the data set downloads. Um, and within, oh, sorry, I'll just go back here and go back to the present mode. Within the Open Targets community, we actually do have a number of uh, full tutorials with sample scripts that you can use that show the different ways that you could access data uh, using BigQuery and our data set downloads. Uh, for example, there's another um, uh, tutorial that we have that is showing how to retrieve information on hundreds of drugs um, using BigQuery. So all of this information is available uh, within the community at community.opentargets.org. Definitely check it out because as I say, if you're looking to do much more systematic and comprehensive queries, our big query and data set downloads are going to be much more advantageous for you. And if we go back here, just very quickly to um, the graph that I was showing before, we talked a little bit about BigQuery and our data set downloads. You can see that if you were to use either the um, BigQuery or the data set downloads, it does require slightly more um, programmatic skill, but it really does allow for much more complex um, data queries. 
and data queries that you can do uh, quite a lot of very interesting things with, um, you know, if you've got it imported into your own pipelines. And so we do support data access in different ways. Um, you can use the data uh, because we're open source. Uh, you can use it for both academic and commercial use. Um, we do have our data access and license documentation that's available. You can join the Open Targets community to get some sample scripts um, in different languages um, and that answer different research questions. Um, and the only thing that we ask is that if you do use our data, please cite our latest publication uh, that we published um, earlier this year. And finally, I will just end with a, a few quick notes and then we can hand over to some questions. Um, we do have the API homepage. So if you go to api.platform.opentargets.org, within that uh, main URL, you can find a link to the browser, which is the interactive playground that I was using here. Uh, we can enter your query on the left side and see the results on the right side. We also have the actual endpoint that you can use if you wanted to generate a script that would uh, actually uh, pull the data uh, from our API. And you can also view the schema as well. Um, personally, I prefer to use the schema uh, and the documentation within the playground, but if you'd like, you can use it. Um, it's a plain text uh, file that you can also access uh, from our API homepage um, as well. If you do have any um, questions, um, you want to get started with the API, you need some help constructing a query string, or perhaps you're not sure, should you be using the API or should you look at maybe another way of accessing our data? You can always reach out to us, uh, helpdesk at opentargets.org. We, we try to respond as quickly as we can, usually within uh, you know, one to two business days. You can also join the Open Targets community because as I say, there's a number of scripts that are already available that you can use um, and begin to access our data in some really new and exciting ways. Uh, and those are available already for you to use. So just a very quick uh, recap, and then I'll hand over to some questions. So the GraphQL API allows you to make graphical language agnostic queries. You can use our interactive browser to test out the queries. We do have several endpoints that you can use, uh, primarily the target, the disease, and the drug endpoints. And you can also query associations uh, and also look at the underlying data as well. Our data can be accessed in a variety of ways. And for those systematic queries, we really do recommend that you use either BigQuery or our data set downloads. But having said that, please do not hesitate to get in touch if you do need any help uh, or you're looking for to do something uh, in particular. We're always interested to not only help users make uh, use of our data, but also learn the different kinds of research questions that they are trying to answer uh, to make sure that we're building a service that really helps you um, in your research. So I do have to say a, a huge thank you to the team uh, that has worked on this. We have an amazing technical team that have rebuilt all of our uh, API infrastructure and made it possible to access our data in, in some really new and exciting ways. We also have Helena and Costas that provide um, the help desk support so it can help you access the data um, you know, and, and point you in the direction of the best way to, to access the data um, based on your specific uh, research question. And just in terms of some closing notes, I think I can hand over to Anna for these, or should we do questions? Anna, what would you prefer? Um, maybe we can do the questions first. Perfect, okay. If there are any around, so. Uh, no, so we don't currently have any additional questions. So if, if you still have questions, please type them in now. Um, but otherwise, I'll just mention, so it was in the previous slide, but if you, so if this was a lot, um, we do have a few recap uh, on how to on what open targets is and how to access it. So over the summer, uh, one of our researchers wrote a series of blog posts called Crash Course and Open Targets, which is a good place to go just if you want a good recap of what was said today. 